Bokitov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research as well. And I have a very powerful message I want to share with you guys, with my friends, both my Christian friends, and especially with my Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, my rabbinical brothers as well. I think this is a very serious message, and I think it's something that as far as the Orthodox community in Israel, is something that you definitely need to stop and take a look at because we're hearing all kinds of nonsense that is going on in the world today, every type of doctrine that you can possibly imagine. And this is exactly what causes my Orthodox brothers and sisters to miss the actual Mashiach himself, to know who the Mashiach is. And instead, they're getting ready to give you something totally different, an Antichrist, one that is supposed to be the Mashiach, but is not. And so I wanted to take and refer back to some things that have happened in history, look at things that have happened in more recent history, and share with you some very powerful insights in regards to this uh, so that you might be better equipped, better aware of what's going on. And then we're going to be getting into later this week here, we're going to be going back and looking at the identity of the Mashiach, where he is throughout the entire uh, Tanakh, and what we should have been looking for when we were looking for the Mashiach to begin with, or even as we look for him today in some cases. All right, going here to Exodus here, I want to share with you in the first chapter, uh, the Egyptians, uh, according uh, to what we're reading here in verse 13, made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, and all their service wherein they made them serve with rigor. And the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was uh, Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to Hebrew women, you shall look upon the birth stool. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then shall... Uh, then she shall live. Uh, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, the children, alive. And that's troubling indeed. Uh, what, basically, it is a f form of late-term abortion is really what the king was asking. We're talking about, in other words, even after the birth, killing the children. So it's really not a difference today and what we're seeing today and what we saw back then. Now, this is not so much a message about abortion, friends, because, uh, but it's more of a point that I'm trying to share with you, and I'm going to get into the reason for this in just a minute, because we're going to go over to Psalm 83, consulting against thy hidden ones, and then also look at the time when Herod was trying to find Yeshua and to take his life. Uh, the things that are going on today, whether it be abortion, whether it be even vaccines uh, that are killing children today, injuring them to, to beyond the capacity to be able to serve God in any form uh, whatsoever, this is an agenda of Satan from the very beginning. But if you look at what Pharaoh was doing when he was in power, he was killing children as well for a different purpose. Now, this article right here is called uh, The Bad Old Days Abortion in America Before Roe vs. Wade. And what I wanted to point out, though, uh, because abortions have been very commonplace. Of course, 1973, it was legalized in the United States. Uh, but this was very troubling, some of the, some of the th things that we were finding inside of these, these articles that we see here. Um, as far as the case numbers, etc. But here we have from the 1940s to 1954, more than 7,000 cases of incomplete abortions were treated and third were complicated by infections. It was one per 1,000 births uh, back in the 50s. Uh, depending on your race, if you were a white woman, it's 2.6 in a 1,000 African women, African American women, uh, half, a per, half of one, uh, so it's like only a half, so one in 2,000 in other words, um, and Puerto Rican women, one uh, per 1,000. Very huge epidemic was going on, and of course the abortions were done in such very, very bad ways, it was causing an epidemic as it were. Uh, I think the estimate was, even in this article here, here it is right here, some 200,000 to 1.2 million abortions per year were taking place back in the 50s. Now, I personally think that 
uh, like in the case of Pharaoh, Pharaoh was not knowledgeable about the coming prophet Moses. Whereas in the case of the Mashiach, Herod got some inside information and went forth to destroy uh, the Messiah, but had to kill a lot of boys to try to find him and still missed. Uh, it, it's the same way uh, as it was with Moses we're seeing in this day and age now, because if the two witnesses are going to be two people anointed with the spirit of Moses and Elijah, or in the case of some that believe in uh, Elijah and Enoch, whichever the case you might choose to believe, but regardless, the point is, is that they're trying, these demons are trying to kill uh, they're trying to kill uh, the ones that would be anointed of the Spirit because they know God can't change his mind. And so Satan is trying to find a way to do it. So as early as the 50s, abortion was an epidemic in this country. Then I found this article that was very troubling indeed, making illegal abortion safer. All right. A clergy consultation service on abortion, a network of concerned pastors and rabbis, this was in the late 60s, set up a referral service to help women find uh, illegal uh, uh, abortions. You know, now the church was getting involved in helping this to, to be facilitated. Uh, so very much a religious uh, type of scenario. And when I look at the religious side of it, this is when I think about the book of Matthew. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east uh, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Jerusalem should have been excited about this. Why would Jerusalem be concerned with him? Because the Pharisees were not the true Levitical priesthood. They were an imposter. Okay, the Pharisees were had been they had been they were the group that were part of the time when the Maccabees came in and overthrew the true uh, uh, Aaronic priesthood and placed in their own priest and began to run things. Now, not to say there weren't some true Aaronics in that group there mixed in amongst them, but most of them had to flee Jerusalem and went down to Qumran. Okay, this is where they went. And some scholars believe that John is actually from that desert region there uh, when he came up. Uh, crying out, you know, uh, repent for the time of the, uh, the Messiah is, is soon to come. All right, so all of Jerusalem is concerned with Herod because why? They're dealing with a false priesthood and they know it. And today it's no different. The church is majorly concerned about the two witnesses coming on the scene because why? They've had 1,800 years under the Vatican and all the offshoots out from underneath the Vatican to be able to control the religions of the world and to be able to say the way, the, uh, the doctrine they want perpetrated to the entire world. So if two witnesses really do come on the scene, this would become a problem for both the church as well as Judaism, the Pharisaic line that is in control in Jerusalem today, this would become a major problem. Now, for those that are come looking for the true coming of the Mashiach to return again for the Christian, for the Jewish people to be the first advent in their way of thinking, you know, they would be more than excited for the coming of the Messiah. They'd be more than excited for the two witnesses to come and set the record straight so that we can get all these problems worked out. But no, it won't be that religious class that is in authority. And that's not just limited to the Vatican. We have uh, many of those uh, out there today uh, that are very prominent members promoting Rome. You have Joel Osteen, the, you know, the, the wealth and fame minister that promises wealth and fame, and that's how you should serve God. You have, uh, uh, 
you know, Tony Palmer, of course, he's passed away, but Kenneth Copeland, he got him in with the Pope. You got John Hagee. You got a whole group of them out there that are promoting Rome now. Okay, so two witnesses could certainly cause some upset for them as well as the Orthodox community in Israel. Now, I do believe that there are many of the Orthodox community that are looking for the coming of the Mashiach, but unfortunately right now, still blinded to who he is, and so therefore it will take a shaking in Israel to wake up the people there. So as we go back here, so when Herod had heard these things, he, uh, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. They didn't want the Mashiach. And if you read the book, uh, the, the Apocryphon of Moses, or the Assumption of Moses there, in that book right there, Moses actually prophesied about the Maccabees. Uh, and not to say that them restoring the temple back for the Jewish people is a bad thing. That was the good part of the Maccabees. But the fact that they threw the uh, Aaronic priesthood out, they replaced the Davidic line of the king of Israel with a false king, that was not good. And Moses said that this group that would do this and that would sell out to the Romans, he even knew who they would sell out to. He doesn't call them the Romans, but the power from the, from the uh, West there, uh, he speaks about that, how that they would sell the, the Jewish nation out, and they did. And he says that they were slaves born of slaves. So they weren't even Israelites. Think about that one for a moment. All right, so anyway... And he gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, and he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Notice what he's doing. He's doing a council meeting. He's meeting with who? The chief priests and the scribes. Who's meeting about the abortions? Right there in the history of abortion? A clergy consultation service on abortion. The scribes, the rabbis coming together to do what? Put more children to death. Not to mention, if you can't get them that way, use the vaccines. Because see, the thing is, they don't have no idea. And they, of course, these rabbis, they, it's not like that they're looking to try to kill the two witnesses. They think that they're trying to do a, a service, okay? You know, what does the scripture say? There, there comes a time they think they do God a service by killing you. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's a novel idea in itself, right? So back to Matthew. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod went, when he had privately called the wise men and inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, and I may come and worship him also. It's the same thing today. Look at all these churches. Look at, look at the Vatican, the chief of them. Rum, and, and, and don't think that they're not the head of these organizations. How many of the organizations have gone and bowed and given allegiance to Rome? Sure they do. Many of them do. Baptists, Pentecostals, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, you name it. They go and they bow down to the Pope. And they give him the allegiance. Why? Because he consults even with them. Now, the wise men were much more honorable than many of the ministers today. When they realized what he was up to, they went another way around, and they left. And that made Herod angry. So what did Herod do? He sends out to kill all the children two years old and under to make sure he gets Jesus. Make sure he kills him. See, Pharaoh was different. Pharaoh had no idea that, that there was a deliverer coming for is uh, for, for, the, for the Jewish people, he just starts having all the children killed as they come out of the womb. It's interesting, he killed the boys and not the girls. I guess they'd use them for sex slaves. But this is, this is how evil this is. Now, I want to share with you some things, though, that we've been overlooking in Psalms. Psalm 83. So many people call this a war. It is a war of sorts, but it's not the war that you think it is. This is more of the conspiracy before the war. Okay, a psalm of Asaph. O God, thou, uh, keep not thou silence and hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. 
For lo, thine enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They hold craft, crafty converse against thy people, and take counsel against thy treasured ones. Now, I think in King James, this is in verse 3, for those of you that are reading King James, or Christian Bible, uh, it is verse 3, I think, for you guys, but here in Hebrew, we have it in verse 4. Okay, they hold crafty converse against thy people. Our al amcha, it is upon or over your people. All right, and then we find, uh, uh, excuse me, ya arimu sod. This is where they're, they're, it's literally like a, a group meeting, is what this is. That's where you get the word sod in here from. Uh, and they are really shrewd, they're figuring out a way to do what? They want to do something about the sefenechad, not treasured ones, but hidden ones. Al sefenecha. How can they get control over them? How do they control them? How do we get control and make sure that we can manipulate what they're going to say or do when they do come? Now, the problem is, the best way is just to make sure you kill them. You know, the same thing like even like in the vaccines. And the vaccine's a little different. It's not say the vaccines are targeting the children per se, but let's say if they were to use it. You know, it's funny. The doctors that tell you it's okay and safe to vaccinate your children are normally the ones that will not vaccinate their own kids. Did you know that? Keep the elite alive and kill all the rest or maim them, or make them incompetent, or whatever they can possibly do. That's what they like to do. All right, so now some say against thy people, al amcha, against, but the word al is really not the word against, and you really need to realize this, and I took the time, and, and let me tell you something, Google Translate is not the way you want to translate uh, Hebrew, but for the purpose of trying to get you to understand this a little bit better, I typed in here for you in Hebrew, al. Okay, out means on or upon. All right, now I'm going to share with you. I know that it's translated many times against in, 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 in Hebrew, and I guess maybe in one way you could say that uh, because it's upon something, so it's like dominating. But just so you understand this, let's look at this. It is a preposition, and as you can see over there, al, 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 second word right there, on, about, to, onto, upon, above by, towards, toward. Nowhere do you find, even in modern Hebrew translations, the word against. It's not there. Why? Because that's not, if you're against something, that's not how we translate it. All right, let's just, for the fun here, let's just do against. Okay, we'll translate that out into Hebrew for you, so it pops over here. Whoop, I didn't write the word, oh, I uh, had the word on in there, sorry against. All right, so let's look at that in Hebrew. Mol is against. Okay, now the reason I say this because the verbiage is very important in Hebrew. When it says here, they hold crafty converse against thy people, it is literally over their people or upon their people. In other words, they're deciding what to do, how to get control of the Jewish people. Now, the thing is, is who's doing this? And we find this out in Daniel chapter 11. I've shared this with you guys many times before. And in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. And again, not against, but upon or over the king of the south. Many will stand up, and that is, Yamaru, uh, uh, okay? They will stand up over the king of the south. All right, the Melech Nagiv, and we know that's the Israeli king because it's the, the king of the Nagiv desert. All right, so in other words, they're exercising authority over him, keeping him in line. Many are going to do that, right? And watch what it says: Uvane paatzi amcha i nasu. All right, and and as we go through there, I'll just make this simpler for you. All right, so. And the sons of, I like to translate this lawless, of your people, they will try to marry the vision. Now you could use the word lift up. Nasu can be used as lift up as well, but it's also a very common use to say to marry the vision. So the lawless of, of Daniel's people, which are the Hebrews of today, the Jewish people in Israel in this case, are going to 
try to marry the vision. And of course, that vision they're trying to marry is Daniel chapter 9, which is all about the coming of the Messiah. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Daniel chapter 9, 24, okay? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to forgive iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. Know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem to one anointed a prince, not just a prince, but a Mashiach, okay, uh, there shall uh, a prince shall be seven weeks and four and three score and two weeks. It shall be built again with a broad place and moat, but in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off. He will die. He will be no more and be no more. And the people of a, of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now that prince is yet to come. All right. But he is from, of, in other words, he is descendant of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, a Roman. Titus, the Roman general, was a prefigure of the prince that shall come, that would destroy the temple and exercise authority over Israel. Rome was doing that today. Pope Pius XII was the one in 1947 that said, make Jerusalem an international city. This is why they did this, all right? And he also wanted to use the name Israel as well because it was more inclusive because they considered themselves the Israel, the replacement theology, all right? So this is what we're dealing with right here. So when we go back over here to Psalm 83 and we look at this again, they hold crafty converse against thy people and take counsel against thy treasured ones, or in this case here, over your people, they're, they're, they, they hold this uh, this this. Uh, very shrewd way of, 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 wor of working together, and they also take a take counsel against the hidden ones, or over the hidden ones. What will they do? How do they control? They're controlling Israel, just like they're trying to do this in order to establish the vision. They're trying to marry the vision. See, they're trying to marry that vision. Now, there was something that I had seen earlier, and I was trying to see if I find it again real quick. Um, Oh, yes, 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 yes. Verse 3. This is another one. For lo, thine enemies are in an uproar. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. Their leader, right? Well, if you look, I wasn't even thinking about this. I read it this morning. I was reading it in Hebrew. Ki uh, oh, uh, oh, excuse me. Oy, oyavecha. See? Ya ma, 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 All right? And we will get it right over here. Nasu rosh. They've married their head. I mean, this is another case of Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel was not an Israelite. She was a foreigner. And Ahab, the king of Israel, married her anyway. What is it start trying, What are they saying over here that they're trying to do in Daniel 11? To marry the vision. Okay? Inasu. Lahamid. Hazon. They want to marry the vision. Who? The the sons of the lawless of Amcha, your people, Daniel, the Hebrew people, are trying to marry the vision. Well, in Psalm 83, they did just that. But they didn't, in this case, they didn't marry the vision, but they married the head. So Rome and the Jewish people living in Israel today have united and married the head. Rome and Israel have become united. But now what they're trying to do is to bring that vision to pass. And at the same time, they're taking crafty counsel. Who is they? The Jews that are, that are the corrupt ones, the lawless that are living in the land, are taking a crafty counsel with what? The Romans. The church. To do what? How are we going to deal with these two witnesses coming? You know why? They've heard too many of those preachers out there. All these churches, they've infiltrated. They've been hearing them talk about those two witnesses coming because they know it's written in Revelation too. And the thing is, they are hidden because God hid them away. Just like Moses. You don't know where his burial place is. Doesn't say in the New Testament that they were, dis you know, uh, Satan was disputing with Michael the archangel the burial place of Moses. You don't think that Satan wouldn't know his actual burial place? 
And the angel says, God rebuke you. Why was he saying that? Because he couldn't figure it out himself. And then when the Messiah comes and dies and resurrects, it's a problem for him. He sees Messiah resurrect. He don't know where Moses is. Moses is hidden just like Elijah was hidden. So they're trying to figure out what to do with the hidden ones. Moses and Elijah. They don't know where they're at. They don't know what to do with them. And now they're conspiring together with the lawless. See, let me, under, let me make one thing clear, my brothers and sisters. Not everybody in Israel today is a false Jew or anything. There's many of the house of Judah that have returned home. Otherwise, Scripture wouldn't be fulfilling. But among them, even as we saw when, when Moses came out of, the wilderness, uh, out of Egypt on the wilderness journey, there was a mixed multitude. We ended up with a mixed multitude in Israel. Not to say that some of them are not Jews as well. They're being lawless because Daniel says, the angel says to Daniel, the lawless of your people. You've got some of your people you can't control and they're going to work with this demon, this head over here, in order to try to bring about the vision. And what does Rome do over there? Rome is the one that's involved in Israel, uniting the three Orthodox, uh, the three uh, uh, religions together: Judaism, Christianity, as or Catholicism, and Judaism. And it's Rome that's doing the Mekodeshit, which means engaged. It is Rome that is trying to bring about Daniel's prophecy over here. Uh, you know, reconciliation for iniquity. Didn't the Pope call that the year of reconciliation? Are you guys getting this? My Jewish brothers, are you getting this? You need to know who your Mashiach really is. You really need to know who he is. And not just assume who he is. And you need to know who the lawless is among you. As I've been bringing out recently and exposing the early part of our history as a nation, although I appreciate that we are a nation in, in the Middle East. I appreciate that Israel is a nation. I do. But I don't like the way the ones that were in power in the beginning got control of this land, became our prime ministers to rule the land as they married up with Rome from the very beginning and killed our brothers. They were coming to try to liberate Jerusalem for the Jewish people. Not just for the Jewish people, but for all Israel. Gosh. Friends, I, I don't want to keep you any longer. I know it can get lengthy sometimes, but I do love you and I appreciate you tremendously. And I know I'm being kind of hard on some things right now. I'm going to really bring out some messages. We're going to go into to the next part. We're going to start getting into redemption. How we know that Yeshua is the Messiah. So those of you that are Jewish that are listening, that's why we're going to publish this on Israeli News Live as well. Because I have a lot of Israelis that listen to this broadcast. You need to know who the Mashiach really is. So that you don't fall for some bogus lie that is coming. If anybody that wants to rule truly with a rod of iron, believe me, Rome would love to rule Israel with a rod of iron and all the Middle East as well. But that's not really what the Messiah was speaking of when it speaks in Revelation that he rules with a rod of iron. It's not like what they have envisioned to bring about a false millennial reign. We love you, though. We, we appreciate you. We thank you. We thank you for listening. And those of you that really are blessed by the work that we're doing, we're trying to do, help us to stay on the air and contribute and make this possible. Because together with us, together, it's the way we do it. Visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. God bless you.